I don't want us to tell each other just so stories, comforting stories that say the law is going to take care of this problem for you, right? Prosecutors will take care of this problem for you. The solution is just around the corner, and it, you know, and it, and it is like a federal prosecutor or a state prosecutor. Or it's Fannie Willis. It's, you know, it's James Comey. It's Robert Mueller. That's not the answer. Welcome to Law and Chaos. Has Elon Musk committed an election crime by paying voters in swing states to register? Let's go with no, even though pretty much everyone on our side is going with yes. And Judge Chetkin finally released the special counsel's 1,900-page appendix, which briefly broke the internet for no reason at all. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. Hey, guys. I'm Liz Dye. With me, as always, is Andrew Torres. Andrew, how are you? I'm doing well, Liz. How are you? I'm all right. I cannot believe it is Monday already. <laughs> Tuesday, as <laughs> you're listening to this. Yeah, no no rest for the weary. We have been cranking out content. And I just have to plug, because you wrote a great piece on Uokava that is up at lawandchaospod.com. Uokava is the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Abroad Voting Act. And uh, it's designed to make it easier for the military to cast their ballots. So why are Republicans so up in arms about it? Uh, you got to read Liz's piece and find out. <laughs> yeah, uh, spoiler alert. It's because in 2020, 60% of the people who used Uokava ballots were non-military. They were just citizens living abroad, and those people are much more likely to vote Democratic than Republicans. So now Republicans have decided that Uokava ballots are bad, actually. Uh, Also (laughs) up on the website, we have a post by my son, Joe Dye, on what he terms the Republican feelings industrial complex. You should read it. It's excellent. If I I I understand I'm not exactly objective, but it really is. He talks about the ways that Republican media feeds Republicans need to feel okay, and that includes a lot of Republican polls from garbage pollsters, which are flooding the market. And look, some of that stuff leaks into our media, into Mm -hmm. normal media. And so if you feel like we all have the yips, that's that's one of the reasons. And you are right. I like to think I'm maybe slightly more objective because we also have a bonus episode with Joe Dye delving into how to test the various claims that are being made by pundits about the election that was released in the main feed. You've probably heard it, but if not, uh, make sure you go back and get it. And and in particular, this really speaks to my heart. It is how, you know, when you're nervous and not sure what to do on election day and it's 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and the polls have only closed in Kentucky and Indiana and like, you know, you're thinking, oh, Trump got 19 electoral votes in deep red states. This is what those states can actually tell us about the state of the race. Yeah. I'm super pleased with how that one turned out. And we have a great multi-part question from a subscriber on Substack, and we posted it to Joe. So let's answer the first part here, and then we will come back at the end of the show and uh, do the other parts of this question. So the question is, where is the best place to view the information discussed in this episode for precinct-specific data for different parts of the counties? Yeah. And so what we're going to do, rather than try and read out URLs on, you know, in an audio medium, which I I don't think would be super useful, we're going to link them in the show notes in this episode. And I have also linked them in the comments section to the original Substack post. So there are different ways to get that, get to those sites and get the data that that Joe was talking about on Election Day. I can't wait to get into the meat of this question. This is a really, really perceptive question. And if you're enjoying our election coverage, uh, do that. Get get on Substack, uh, get on Patreon. Patreon, send us a message, uh, and uh, we're we're interacting with those. That it really helps us uh, understand how to deliver to you the kinds of stories that you care about between now and election day, and and help you sort out the noise. So uh, we'll get to that in the final segment of the show. And uh, you know, based on the feedback we've gotten, we're going to continue to come at you with election stuff from now and until election day. So uh, keep those questions coming, and we will keep trying to help you sort through the noise. Yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that on Friday we can have a whole show talking about pending election litigation and what to expect going forward. But for today, our first story is about Elon Musk and vote buying, maybe. 
<laughs> Elon Musk started a super PAC, imaginatively titled America PAC. Uh, he actually stole the at America Twitter handle from the person who had been using it. And he's been using this PAC to shovel gobs of money at Donald Trump and right wingers, like somewhere approaching $100 million, which is bad and wildly hypocritical in that he pointed to the political affiliation of the previous owners of Twitter as evidence that they used the platform to sway the 2020 election. But it is not illegal for Musk and his Silicon Valley buddies to pour cash into the election, uh, you know. Thanks, John Roberts. Musk has also done two things that I think were designed to catch the attention of the press and garner him some earned media off of mm -hmm. left wingers like us accusing him of illegal vote buying. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So spoiler alert, they are not vote buying. And our side calling them that is, I think, doing us a disservice, right? Because what Musk and the right wing are doing is actually much more insidious, much worse. And we should be talking about that. But but we'll get to it. Okay. So Musk's PAC created a petition that is, you know, it's pretty silly. It says <laughs> in its entirety, the First and Second Amendments guarantee freedom of speech and the right to bear arms. By signing below, I am pledging my support for the First and Second Amendments. Uh, deep, yeah, deep thoughts right here. Uh, I mean, the website <laughs> itself looks like 1991 GeoCity stuff. It's just, it's just a seven tweet scroll of like incendiary posts by MAGA influencers like Jack Posobiec and stuff. Uh, and it's got a picture of Musk wearing a black MAGA hat. That's like literally it. We'll link to it in the show notes. Like, bro, do you even tech? <laughs> and like, online petitions are worthless even when they're not stupid. Uh, the only point of this exercise is to harvest the names and contact information from anyone dumb enough to sign it so that Musk can target them later with I don't know, sell them stuff, sell their names, solicit them to buy Trump watches, whatever. I mean, I think putatively the plan is to use this for get out the vote, but they're so far behind on that. Like two weeks before the election is too damn late to mm -hmm. be, you know, using these names for GOTV. They're, they're just behind the eight ball. And in fact, that's kind of the, the knock on. I mean, Musk has been using a lot of this money to bankroll get out the vote operations for the campaign. And there's been a lot of reporting that says that he's done a pretty crap job at it. And also, more hilariously, that he fired the vendor and had to hire all of these new GOTV door knockers on the fly. And that some of them, that they have what we would call a high rate of failure, high rate of potential <laughs> fraud that, you know, they all, they log on to an app and the app keeps flagging them as having a very high potential fraud rate. So uh, Musk <laughs> getting spammed by campaign bots is, is well, that's kind of perfect. Anyway, <laughs> but fine. Okay. Online petitions as a way to kind of generate a mailing list. Okay, fine. Totally normal. But Musk did two not normal things. First, he offered to pay $47 to anyone who filled out the petition and also referred a registered voter in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, or North Carolina. That was later increased to $100 for Pennsylvania only. And then, because that apparently wasn't enough, Musk also started a lottery where one <laughs> petition signer from any of the seven swing states will supposedly receive a million dollars a day from October 19th through Election Day. You know, we're going to link to the petition, but I think it's really important, you guys, that you only sign up for it if you're very very serious. It would be immoral <laughs> and unconstitutional and just plain wrong to sign up, to go to this website, which we're linking to in the show notes, and put garbage data in to the blanks there, which is unverifiable. I, I don't want Huggin you to do kiss. that. Why can't I, I find I, Amanda I, Hug and Kiss? I don't want you to do that. And I, and I want you to take this seriously because our <laughs> democracy is resting on it. <clears throat> okay. So look, people are calling what Musk did vote buying. So let's do that thing that we do on this show and be precise about the difference between the colloquial use of terms versus the actual criminal statutes. And, and I should add at the outset that Musk's 
giveaway thing may be, I mean, there's so many questions about it, right? Like it may violate Pennsylvania illegal state law lottery. I, I don't know about that. And various states like Arizona do indeed have specific laws about whether you can pay campaign workers to register people, right? So I'm not saying that this has the seal of approval from this show. Don't take legal advice from a podcast. Anyway, uh, that this is perfectly fine. But, but what I'm saying is the question we've gotten a hundred times over the weekend that's on everyone's mind, which is, is this vote buying? We think it isn't, even though almost everybody on our side thinks that it is. Yeah. And look, I mean, we just published a post on our site about the Republican feelings industrial complex. We don't want to give you the Democratic feelings industrial complex. We would actually <laughs> like to give you our, our real opinion, even if it isn't what you want to hear. Yeah. So, Liz, will you indulge me on a very quick foray into 13th century Saxony? Why do you ask me this like I'm a taskmaster, like never letting you take any, you know, frolic and detours? I, I, oh, yes, I, obviously. I, 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 it's, it's completely unwarranted. I, but... <laughs> Look, we won't get to it. But after an ad break, unless, of course, you are a supporter at patreon.com slash law and chaos pod or on law and chaos dot com, at which point no ads for you ever. And we're back. Okay, so Liz, weird thing. For most of the history of democracy as a concept, particularly in the United States and Britain, votes were not taken by secret ballot, right? Sometimes they weren't even written down, like you would just call out your vote orally. And I, Abraham Lincoln, to pick someone at random, famously defended that practice in Illinois in, in 1840. And even when votes were written down, the practice was ubiquitous that it wasn't secret. Your name wasn't censored. Parties and later newspapers would just distribute pre-filled out ballots that you as the voter were supposed to sign your name to and drop into public boxes. And then those political parties and elected officials and anybody who was interested could could check to see how Andrew Torres voted and, you know, reward me or extract revenge accordingly. <laughs> okay. Progressive reformers in the 19th century upended that system. They argued that it perpetuated fraud. And okay, not to sidebar my sidebar, but the academic literature on this is really interesting. Like, they're not so certain that the reformers were right. Uh, Allen and Allen, for example, conclude that the unsystematic, undocumented, partisan, and emotional nature of most of the literature indicates that the charges of vote fraud in the 19th century were probably gross exaggerations. So their argument was that public voting was at least as much of a disincentive to fraud as private voting. and. I, you know, look, whoever's right, the reformers won out, right? And and the secret ballot was first developed, used in Tasmania in 1856, uh, and then quickly spread throughout the rest of the democratic world, uh, was known as the Australian secret ballot for about a, a century. Today, the UN Declaration of Human Rights declares democracy as a human right and defines that as genuine elections, which shall be held by secret vote or equivalent free voting procedures. So that's now become part and parcel of what we think of as free and fair elections. One of the interesting economic consequences of the secret ballot is that it led to the decline of outright vote buying. See, I, pr I promise you I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> <laughs> or clientelism, right? Which was the, the practice of politicians and political parties of paying a third party intermediary, a vote broker, if you will, to deliver a bunch of votes on behalf of your candidate. You would just pay by the vote. Isn't that what we would call in the modern era, perhaps in Chicago, walking around money? Yeah, exactly right. And look, the reason that the secret ballot pretty much ended clientelism is actually one, it's an economic reason, right? Not a legal reason. It, it, it's one of verification, right? Because if the ballots are public, then if I'm the campaign manager and I pay Liz Dye to deliver me 10,000 votes, I can check to see if you actually delivered those votes. Once the ballots uh, are Unlike on an <laughs> online petition in favor of the First and uh, Second Amendments, just, just as a for example. Just spitballing. Yeah, right. Once those ballots became secret, it's now much harder for me to see if my money spent on a vote broker was well spent, right? If, if the vote broker made good on their promises, because 
I know you're going to be shocked by this, Liz, but it turns out that people who will take money to subvert democracy are also not shy about just stealing money and then lying about it. So, you know, (laughs) so that really eliminated clientelism as a valid strategy for how to spend your scarce resources. Like it was actually better to just get out and stump and campaign and spend money on advertising. Here's how Stokes et al. put it. They said, in 19th century Britain and the United States, vote buying was commonplace. Parties gave voters cash, food, alcohol, health care, poverty relief, and myriad other benefits in exchange for their votes. To gain leverage over them, the parties gathered certain information about voters' debts, their crimes, even their infidelities. Is this a political party or is this Scientology? (laughs) Why not both? Uh Um, Anyway, the point is, once the ability to make sure that you could verify whether the broker delivered the goods went away... So did the practice, I mean, for the most part. And and again, I'm not saying that what replaced it was tons better, particularly in the post-Citizens United world, but that's what led to today. It was helped along also by contemporaneous criminal reforms that accompanied the secret ballot that made outright vote buying a crime. And that excellent frolic plus a little detour <laughs> plus a little frolic on the end of it is the context for how we should interpret the relevant law here, which is 52 U.S.C. 10307. It's part of the Civil Rights Act of 1965, and it makes it a crime uh, to, among other things, knowingly or willfully pay or offer to pay or accept payment either for registration to vote or for voting. So it's a felony punishable by up to five years in prison, and the law by its terms applies only to presidential House and Senate elections. Noted election lawyer and UCLA law professor Rick Hassan has written a blog post that has gotten massive attention. We will link to it in the show notes. It's called Elon Musk Veers into Clearly Illegal Vote Buying, Offering a Million Dollars Per Day Lottery Prize Only to Registered Voters. And his argument is that Musk's payment to sign the petition might violate the law, but the $1 million lottery definitely does. And I have massive respect for this guy. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and And I have linked to his work in other things that I have written, but I don't think we agree on this one. Yeah. And I think part of the reason for that is that Hassan's argument, probably unintentionally, focuses on the wrong element of 10307, right? So here's the thing that he's 100% correct about, and that is that entering people in a lottery for a chance of winning a million dollars a day is absolutely a payment or thing of value under the U.S. election laws, right? But here's what that means, right? Historically, it means giving someone either an actual lottery ticket or the entry in an illegal lottery as a quid pro quo, right? In exchange for their direct vote. That's what violates the law. And it does, even if the ticket itself, the lottery ticket says no cash value. or Because the, the proper inquiry is whether the thing you are giving to a prospective voter has value from the perspective of the voter, right? And, and that comes out of a 1983 case from the Fifth Circuit called U.S. versus Garcia. Uh, interesting case. It said it was a bribe for the Duval County, Texas welfare director to give out welfare vouchers in exchange for voters who promised to vote for him, right? And and one of the arguments that the director raised on appeal after he got convicted was, look, this wasn't really a payment to anybody because those voters might have gotten welfare anyway. I mean, and, and it didn't cost me anything, so that's not a payment. And the Fifth Circuit was like, get out of here. <laughs> so yes, a chance to win a million dollars under the Garcia rule is definitely a payment. Right. There's there shouldn't be any dispute about that. The question is, is that a payment that Musk is offering under the statute either for registration to vote or for voting? And I just don't think he is right. Like everyone on our side. Yeah. Is saying that the forty seven dollar payments and the lottery are in exchange for registering to vote in a swing state. But that's not what they are not by their explicit terms, right? Therefore, signing his petition and or referring another person who signs that petition. And Liz, as you said, that's a thing campaigns do all the time, right? And and yes, right, we know the purpose of that petition is to incentivize registration, right? But it's also very clearly a donor list. And right, that's standard political practice. So in response to that, right, because various 
largely Republican lawyers who tend not to have a lot of credibility have made that argument. The, the this is vote buying crowd have said, right, right, right. But the only people who are eligible to sign the petition are swing state voters who register or have registered to vote. So that's tantamount to paying them to register to vote. And I get the logic, right? That makes sense to me. But there are zero cases that say that. Right. What the case law says, and I've been through it pretty extensively, is that the payment has to knowingly be for, in this case, registering to vote. Right. So, for example, some people have pointed to an oopsie by Ben and Jerry's in 2008, where the ice cream shops were offering free scoops to anyone who came into a Ben and Jerry's with an I voted sticker. And a bunch of other businesses did, you know, similar things, discount yoga, free donuts, bagels, coffee, whatever. And those all did violate the law. But here's the thing. Those were direct payments for voting. The I voted sticker is functionally a receipt for Mm -hmm. having cast your ballot, right? I mean, it's not literally a receipt, but fine. Ben and Jerry's, for example, subsequently changed that promo to anyone who came in with any sticker on at all on election day, even though, you know, most most people aren't wearing stickers on their clothes. Like if you're wearing a sticker on election day, it probably says I voted. Whatever. But that was fine because it wasn't like come in with your proof of voting and we'll give you a thing of value. Yeah, exactly. So look, the reason we're pushing back here is is really twofold. First, and, and we say this every episode, Donald Trump is a criminal multiple times over, right? And, and Elon Musk, not a convicted criminal, but he's skirted the law. He's abused the legal system. We've talked about his absolutely unconscionable lawsuits that are designed to intimidate tiny nonprofits into silence, right? And his companies are under multiple federal investigations, which may be one of the reasons I speculate that why he's, you know, plowing so much cash into Trump's campaign. Yeah, you, you think those investigations will go away if Donald Trump is elected president? I mean, I, I, it's a possibility. <laughs> yeah. So look, the first thing is we don't want to dilute those accurate and fair criticisms with, you know, edge cases, misplaced accusations, that sort of thing. And the second reason that we're pushing back here is that I think this expansive reading of vote buying is dangerous. Yeah, I I just want to jump in here because I did cover the entire first Trump administration. And I have written my share of articles with a headline that was like, Mueller's coming, you know, like Omar's coming, but Robert Mueller. And one of the things which I hope that we on our side are doing better now, and it is in, in line with the comments about the Republican feelings industrial complex, I don't want us to tell each other just so stories, comforting stories that say the law is going to take care of this problem for you, right? Prosecutors will take care of this problem for you. The solution is just around the corner and it, you know, and it and it is like a federal prosecutor or a state prosecutor. Or it's Fannie Willis, it's, you know, it's James Comey, it's Robert Mueller. That's not the answer. The only way to, you know, get out of this, the only answer is to do the work. There will not be one weird trick. And also, I think it's disingenuous to tell ourselves those stories, um, which is why, I, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this segment, because I don't want us to be the democratic feelings industrial complex. Hear, hear. And I want to add a second reason, which is that in a vacuum, I'm not sure. No, let me let me make it more strongly. I think that this is not a good reading of election law. I wouldn't want this to be the law. Now, let me parse this really, really narrowly, right? Because some statutes, like the bribery laws, will prohibit directly or indirectly giving a thing of value to a candidate or elected official. And you and I have been unstinting in our criticism of the way in which the the court and a 9-0 decision from the Supreme Court, right, signed on to by Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the Bob McDonnell case, have, you know, cut that really, really narrow. Like, that makes no sense to me, right? I support a broad reading of the bribery statutes because we should err on the side of, no, let's not bribe our elected officials. But when you're talking about vote buying, indirect promises of benefits are what we call democracy, right? Like, I'll give you an example. Right now, on her website, Kamala Harris has a promise to give people who start a business $50,000 in tax breaks if she's elected president. So I'm planning on starting a business and Harris's campaign says, hey, prospective business owners should register to vote, right? 
in a sense, that is an indirect promise, not a direct promise, but it's an indirect promise that I'm going to be better off. I'm going to get $50,000 if Harris is president, and that's going to be better than the Trump administration. And look, obviously, that's not a crime. It shouldn't be one. No one thinks that it is. But the question is, do we err on the side of punishing things that look more like participation in the democratic process? So I think the most that you can say about what Elon Musk has done is that he is paying for a list of names and that to qualify to be on that list, you must be a registered voter in a swing state. I want to be clear. I do not think that that means that we can't do anything about this practice, right? Like if we had sensible campaign finance laws, we would count that as a thing of value and we would it would count against the campaign spending limits or, you know, we could otherwise bring it, right? I'm not saying that we're powerless to stop it. But what I'm saying is that I don't think the criminal laws as they are currently written cover this sort of conduct, right? If Elon Musk takes that list and targets the people on it and then sends them a follow-up text that says, hey, here's more money. Now, if you go and actually vote for Trump, then yeah, that's crime and, you know, lock him up. But until he does that, it's not paying people to vote or register to vote. I can find no case that has ever upheld or even involved a criminal conviction under this statute or, or its predecessor for functionally generating mailing lists, even if they have these sorts of criteria on it. Rick Hassan links to the DOJ's election crimes manual. I have been through that too. And none of the guidance covers indirect payments of the sort. The closest it comes is when politicians pay voters directly, but then lie about why they've done it, right? Like, so disguising outright bribes as payments to work on their campaign. And yeah, that too is illegal, but that's not what this is. And I guess the last thing if you're sort of looking at how courts tend to interpret the intersection of these two issues, I was reminded of kind of an emerging issue of, around ballot selfies, right? Which are exactly what they sound like, right? You know, selfie culture people. 2008 and 2016 in particular, for some reason, thought that they might like to record for posterity and share over the internet a uh, historic casting of a ballot. So they took selfies, uh, they shared them out, and New Hampshire in 2014 passed a bill, HB 366, that specifically prohibited that. And it did so under all of the vote buying reasons that we just that we talked about, right? It was saying, look, you're providing proof of who you voted for, that's illegal. And that law got struck down by the courts, right? First, the district court upheld by the First Amendment. The Supreme Court let it stand, didn't, didn't grant cert. The First Circuit said efforts to reduce voter fraud by prohibiting ballot selfies are, quote, burning down the house to roast the pig, end of quote. So I, it, I just I don't see it. OK, that is enough with uh, one of the modern era's great villains, Elon Musk. We will <laughs> be back to discuss another great modern villain right after this brief ad break, unless you are a subscriber, in which case, not for you, baby. Okay, so last week, Donald Trump had his appendix out. Oh, but um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I will be here all the week. Try the schnitzel. No, Ooh. we are talking, of course, about the latest filing in the election interference case. And I think we learned two important things here. First, we learned that Trump's lawyers are screaming piss babies who were hired solely to throw tantrums on the public docket. Oh, oh yeah. We, we learned that this week. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's not that big a revelation, but it is remarkable just how much of a fuss they put up over the stupidest shit. Like, what was the purpose of them threatening to hold their breath until they turned blue if Judge Chutkin didn't hold that filing until after the election? Like, the very little bit that was publicly unsealed was a gigantic nothing burger. No one was going to read it or care, particularly on a Friday afternoon, less than three weeks before the election. And yet Trump's lawyers, Todd Blanche and John Lauro, flipped out about how unfair it would be to release it. I mean, we are going to talk in this segment about what we can glean from the little bit we got to see. But honest to Pete, what was the point of all that? <laughs> yeah. And, and Liz, before we talk about the contents of the appendix itself, l l let's Drill down a little bit into what you just teed up and, and talk about what led up to it, right? Because Judge Tanya Chutkin was pissed. And that ruling came out Thursday evening after we'd already recorded the show. So just to briefly recap, special counsel Jack Smith 
filed an opening immunity brief in order to comply with the Supreme Court's instructions in Trump v. U.S. That defended the superseding indictment in D.C. in light of the Supreme Court's immunity ruling, right? So remember, that document is not about whether Trump is guilty. It's about whether the evidence that would be used to support the allegations in the superseding indictment should be admitted at all under the rules that the Supreme Court just made up, right? Whether that underlying conduct was official presidential stuff, right? But that conduct is mounting a coup. So, you know, Donald Trump strenuously objected to the document being filed and then to it being released on the theory that reminding people that he committed a coup on January 6th amounted to election interference in that people tend not to like to vote for candidates who break the law. And the court said, uh, Judge Chutkin said, no, that's not a thing. But Mr. Trump, if you would like to object to specific revelations, right, or argue that something should be redacted in order to protect witnesses, I'll give you a week to do that. Donald Trump responded to that by throwing another tantrum, by calling the redactions, quote, impotent, which I don't think that's what that word means. Anyway, and, and then repeating that, you know, the brief shouldn't be released at all. In addition to the brief, right, wherever it makes a factual assertion, the special counsel has a gigantic appendix of documents that support those factual assertions, right, that they're they're the actual documentation that was filed simultaneously, scheduled to be released on the public docket two weeks later. So we got a chance to watch them repeat this dance again. Special counsel's office said, here's what we think should be released publicly. Donald Trump got seven days to comment on the redactions, and after seven days, he had no comment on the redactions. He just threw yet another tantrum, said it was election interference to put it on the public docket. Third verse, same as the first, but this time he asked for an additional seven-day stay of the appendix's release to pursue his, quote, litigation options. Right. And that's where you and I had that bet 10 days ago, Andrew, because you said they're going to do nothing. They're not going to file anything. And I said, no, they're 100 percent going to file something with the D.C. Circuit in hopes of wringing at least a couple days of administrative stay out of this process. But it turns out what they did was file the same stupid tantrum one more time (laughs) in front of Judge Chetkin, only this time they kind of reworded it. So instead of saying, Judge, it will be political interference for you to release this document, they said, here's the actual quote or an actual quote from this document. Although the court has decided over President Trump's objections that the political consequences of these proceedings is not a cognizable legal prejudice, the court has not yet addressed the public's interest in assuring that this case does not unduly interfere or appear to interfere with the ongoing election. A temporary stay would serve that interest by ensuring that the redacted appendix is accompanied by President Trump's rebuttal, reducing, but again, not eliminating this case's improper impact on the election, as well as the potential for voter confusion. Additionally, a stay would promote public confidence in the integrity of these proceedings and a court's duty to remain (laughs) apolitical. I'm I'm trying to, I know you said you weren't going to take the political campaign into account, but have you thought about the political campaign? It's just, this is not real lawyering. So Liz, you graciously agreed to call it a draw on our bet, even though Trump actually filed something. And we agreed that Judge Chuckin was going to drop kick this whatever it was motion I, I, yeah, with extreme prejudice. And uh, she did uh, <laughs> right after we recorded the show on Thursday. So first, she reminded Trump again that there is uh, actual law here. There's a six factor test that was articulated by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit from a 1980 decision called U.S. v. Hubbard for what it takes to keep filings in a criminal case under seal. And those six factors are, one, the need for public access, two, the extent of previous public access to those documents, three, the fact that someone has objected to the disclosure and the identity of of that person, four, the strength of any property and privacy interests that are asserted, five, the possibility of prejudice, and six, the purposes for which the documents were introduced. And you will note that absolutely none of those factors involves making the court look political, right, which is why Trump's brief, I'm not kidding, ignored Hubbard pretty much almost entirely, right? Like, you know, it, it howled about prejudice in the abstract, but like, here's how Judge Chutkin put it. Setting aside the oxymoronic proposition that the public's understanding of this case will be enhanced by withholding information about it, any public debate about the issues in this case has no bearing on this court's resolution of those issues. And in any event, the court is not limiting the public's access to only one side. 
defendant is free to submit his legal arguments and factual proffers regarding immunity at any point before the November 7th, 2024 deadline. And I really, this was so clever, right? Because essentially what Judge Chutkin was saying was, look, there's not a thing in criminal procedure. You're not entitled to simultaneous release of information to protect the public from learning about the case. I, that That's nonsense. But if you care so much about the timing, Mr. Trump, you're free to turn in your homework early, which, of course, is the thing they absolutely do not want to do, right? Like they fought hard to make sure that deadline was November 7th and the election is November 5th. So uh, bottom line, Judge Chutkin ordered the appendix released, uh, and it was on Friday afternoon. <laughs> right. At which point, Pacer broke, because <laughs> every reporter in D.C. and, you know, basically the entire country tried and at the same I. time <laughs> to download this document. It took us like 50 minutes to get it. And I think we wound up getting it, or at least in part, from Lawfare. A couple of them we had to get from Lawfare, which posted yeah. the documents. Like we Thanks, Anna get Bauer. <laughs> yeah. But- there was nothing. It was nothing, nothing, nothing. And, and it was, was weird because Trump's lawyers had seen this big pile of nothing. They knew what was in there. And they threw the tantrum with the full knowledge that the only new revelation, the only document that was both visible and not previously released, was a brief transcript of a White House valet testifying that he took Trump's coat on January 6th after the ellipse speech and then parked the president in front of the television and told him there was rioting at the Capitol, after which the valet toddles off to fetch a Diet Coke and end scene. Right. That's the only thing that was new here. And actually, House Republicans put part of that transcript out themselves after the January 6th committee was disbanded as a part of a gotcha to prove that the committee was hiding evidence, which it which it wasn't. Right. I, I think some reporters have suggested that the original transcript was redacted or withheld because the valet was looking at photographs of himself mm. and Trump on that day to refresh his memory. And the photos were withheld to protect the valet's identity. Got it. I don't know whether that's true or not, but whatever. The transcript was uninteresting other than establishing that Trump knew at 120 that his people were riding at the Capitol, which, you know, an interesting detail, but not perhaps germane to this document. Anyway, despite Trump's lawyers screaming about protecting witnesses and dangerous political interference in the election, whatever, this thing is like 1,900 pages, of which about 1,600 just say sealed mm-hmm. and are blank. Like, this is a stupid four volume thing, broke pacer. Like ninety percent blank pages. Great job. Yeah, and we gotta own our role in this one. Right? Like you and I thought this was gonna be amazing, in in part because Trump's lawyers threw such a fit. Right? This, this was I, I I won't I won't bring you into a list, but this was my be there will be wild moment, and and we were there, and it was mild. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. But I think you can make some educated guesses about the special counsel's strategy from the few things that we did get to see. Uh, I mean, for the most part, we got nothing. So oh. uh, that's Yeah, okay. Well, good. good. This has been a great show. Good, to, good talking to everybody. We'll see you on Friday. Ha 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 ha. No, not nothing, nothing. So look, there are basically four kinds of documents in this data set. Transcripts from the January 6th committee, mm-hmm. Trump tweets, Trump campaign communications and other public records from court filings and government offices, government reports, and a lot of stuff from election officials in the swing states debunking the election fraud lies Trump and his campaign were peddling. Mm -hmm. There are also some screenshots from Mike Pence's book, So Help Me God. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> that's the title. That's that's not an ex- exclamation. That's, that that uh, is what it, I thought when I had to read it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Although, you know, pour one out for that staffer that had to read that stupid book and highlight it and then, you know, put the screenshots in here. Anyway, the point of a lot of this stuff, the reason that it's appearing in this document is to backstop the claim that none of what Trump did on and leading up to January 6th was part of his official duty, particularly with respect to Mike Pence. Yeah, that's right. Liz, you and I have talked about how we think Jack Smith is on the shakiest ground here with respect to the claims and seeking evidence regarding Trump's communications and and efforts to pressure Mike Pence, right? The Chief Justice John Roberts' opinion, I think, you think, went out of its way to say that the president is often going to send the vice president down to Congress to break ties and that their discussions of what he does as president of the Senate are official, even though the vice president 
as a matter of law, is acting in a legislative capacity as president of the Senate and not in an executive capacity and should not be covered by the Trump v. U.S. immunity ruling. But so, for instance, Vice President Harris has has often broken ties when it when it came to President Biden's judicial nominees. Are we now saying that her discussions with President Biden about that are not part of her job? Right. Yeah, no, clearly, clearly not. But to the point, the Supreme Court's conservatives have all but said they're going to treat the pressure campaign against Pence, at least insofar as Trump discussed it with him as part of Trump's official duties. I mean, I look, we've said it on the show before. We think that Smith may be tilting at windmills here, trying to get those Pence communications with Trump into the record. But I admit, when the January 6th committee report was released a couple of years ago, I read testimony by Pence's aide, Greg Jacobs, and it does hit different now after the immunity ruling was released. It was Mm -hmm. part of it was was visible in this appendix. I mean, at the time, it seemed like pressuring the vice president to mount a coup was obviously a crime. But now you look at this testimony and the rest of the testimony from the um, January 6th committee and different stuff jumps out at you, right? For me, what jumps out now is that it was John Eastman, the lawyer for Trump's campaign, leaning on Greg Jacob to get Pence to reject the swing state electors. And that prima facie establishes that the conversation is clearly not official, right? Because it's it's with somebody who's in the campaign, not an, a government official. Right. And in fairness to us, we weren't looking at it through that lens two years ago because, of course, stealing an election is a crime, whether you do it while you're on the clock or off the clock. But now we have to look at everything and go, okay, is this part of his official duties? Because any evidence, anything that calls into question official conduct is out, thanks to the Supreme Court. Right. And a lot of us read those transcripts two years ago and haven't given them any thought since. So for instance, there's a I mean, not us, of, but <laughs> yeah, no, well, so I mean maybe. So at the time when we first read these documents, Haley's testimony seemed important because it described how someone took the verbal attack on Pence out mm-hmm. of the ellipse speech and Trump himself put it back in, which sure seems like he was trying to get his vice president killed. But now the thing that jumps out from Haley's testimony is that there were two separate systems for handling speeches in the White House. One was dedicated to campaign speeches and one was dedicated to presidential speeches. And it shows that they were definitely trying to segregate the stuff. And that demonstrates that in real time, they thought of things as presidential and non-presidential, right? Mm-hmm. So so Haley says, the two processes were slightly different. The White House counsel advised that on political speeches to minimize, you know, writing them on your work computer. And so, you know, we would, on political speeches, initial drafts would be done on personal laptops. And then as we got to speech day, they would go into the official system. And so that would be an example of a different process. And the questioner says, but other than that, mostly the same. And Haley says, well, on political speeches, it was pretty clear as a rule of thumb that, you know, you would that the political people would only be working on them. The fact checkers could check the facts, but political people, only political people worked on the political speeches. Mm -hmm. So later in the interview, Haley kind of tried to fudge and say, well, this ellipse rally on January 6th wasn't a campaign event. It was a political event. It was a speech to an outside political group where Trump was being asked to comment on the news of the day, which, come (laughs) on, dude. But also later in the document, later in this appendix, you can see screenshots of the campaign sending out solicitations and invitations to the January 6th rally, referring to it as a campaign rally, right? So rebutting what Haley said and giving more credence to the idea that the speech itself was in his capacity as a candidate, not in his capacity as the president of the United States. The Appendix also contains testimony from Amy Kremer and her daughter Kylie, who are these like horrible women who got their start in the Tea Party. They organized the two days of events on January 5th and 6th. They coordinated the speakers. They set up funding to get the buses there. um, And they referred to the events as a rally. And Mm -hmm. for that matter, so did Roth Worthington, another speechwriter in the Trump White House. He called it the last rally. which like clearly more evidence that it was a campaign event and Trump was acting in his capacity as a candidate, not as an office holder. But I want to pick up on something that you said in episode 70, Andrew, because you noted that the immunity brief 
quotes White House lawyer Eric Hirschman a lot talking about the Hatch Act. But Hirschman is a lawyer, and uh, he's he's an evil son of a bitch, but he's he's smart. So he was acting as a White House conduit to the campaign, and because he's not an idiot, he was trying pretty hard to comply with the Hatch Act. And just to refresh your memory, the Hatch Act prevents electioneering by government employees when they are on duty. Yeah, I, I think this is really the key to understanding how Jack Smith is going to prosecute this case, right? And when we think about the Hatch Act, uh, at least for me, I tend to think about Kellyanne Conway smirking and saying, yeah, oh, tell me when the sentence starts. And and then I get angry. And, and you know, I, I feel justified in that because no previous president has ever abused the Hatch Act the way that Donald Trump did. But oh, my God, the man held the RNC at the White House. Yeah, I, exactly. But look. 99.99% of Hatch Act cases are adjudicated by the Merit Systems Protection Board without presidential interference, right? Like, he can jump in when it's himself or it's his White House chief of staff or it's Kelly and Conway. But, like, the day-to-day Trump foot soldiers care very deeply about not running afoul of it because they're not going to get protected. And, look, it's not hard to comply with the Hatch Act, right? You you can even do political stuff during the workday so long as it's clear that you're doing it as a volunteer for the campaign and not in your governmental capacity. So it makes sense that Eric Hirschman would want to say, all right, here's the guidelines so that you don't get reprimanded or fired for helping us out on our campaign events. So what we have now are a bunch of contemporaneous emails, memoranda, agendas, itinerary, day-to-day documents that come out from the office, you know, attached to the office of the president saying, hey, uh, we're taking these six staffers to Georgia today for a rally to try and reelect Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. And that and, and the documents themselves say, and that's obviously a campaign event and not government business. So they're not running afoul of the Hatch Act. So here's how they're complying. Right. And that's Sharp contrast to Kellyanne Conway, obviously, but also to Peter Navarro, Mm -hmm. who totally disregarded the Hatch Act and then claimed that all his electioneering was covered by executive privilege. Actually, let me (laughs) let me break that one down. Right. Because there are actually references. Trump tweeted out, for instance, a report which Navarro had done in his capacity as White House economic advisor doing purporting to do an analysis, a statistical analysis that proved that Trump could not possibly have lost. Uh, It was it was garbage. I think the basis of it was that two counties next door to each other couldn't possibly have such different votes. And ipso facto, the county that went for Biden must have been stolen. (laughs) It was really stupid. Uh The point was that he claimed to be doing that in his official capacity. And it didn't start after the election. In fact, before the election, he more or less spent the months of September and October going on Fox News and saying, I'm the White House economic advisor. And I'm telling you that if you elect Beijing Biden, he's going to turn the country (laughs) over to China and the economy will crash, whatever, whatever. And then after the election, he'd been spending all of this time, you know, cahootsing with Steve Bannon and what they called the Green Bay Sweep, and that was the plan to substitute the fake electors for the real ones, or at least disrupt Congress long enough that you could like thwart the certification. And then he said, all of that was done in my official capacity, and so it was covered by executive privilege. And uh, the Justice Department said, ha, 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 no. (laughs) And anyway, he got convicted of contempt of Congress and emerged from jail just in time to address the RNC. Anyway, Peter (laughs) Navarro had a Hatch Act report, which was released on November 18th, 2020. And that report is an exhibit in this appendix. It's one of the few documents that we can see. Mm -hmm. And to kind of come back to the point, it reinforces what you said in episode 70, that Smith is going to look to the Hatch Act for support to say, here is the line between what's official and what is not, right? Trump is going to say, Everything I did was official, which is which is what Peter Navarro said. And the Supreme Court is going to say, well, who can say? Guess we better err on the side of calling all of this conduct official or future presidents won't be able to act boldly and do crimes. Uh, And that sounds like a joke, but that's that's functionally the holding of Trump v. U.S. Mm -hmm. And so Smith, smartly, I think, is going to say, no. There is a whole developed body of law and precedent here. There is a rubric dividing official conduct from campaign conduct, and that rubric is the Hatch Act. And look, we have further evidence that everybody in the White House knew 
because they all got dinged for violating the Hatch Act. And here, here's us telling Peter Navarro on November 18th in a document which was widely disseminated at the White House and reported on, you have violated the Hatch Act. You have electioneered. This conduct is not official. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. And uh, with that in mind, now we're going to move on to finish up that question about how to watch the election returns come in on Election Day after this brief ad break. Unless, of course, you're a supporter, you know the drill. Okay, we are back. Let's return to that terrific multi-part question about Joe's piece on how to watch the election returns on Election Day at 6 p.m. We have another piece, which we're going to post on the website, but let's talk about it for a minute now. Yeah, I had so much fun recording this episode with Joe. Like, look, on Election Day, I'm anxious, I'm nervous all day, and now, now... I have been given a numbers-driven assignment <laughs> that, that kicks in in the early evening, and I am here for it. I mean, gagasund. But in all seriousness, I am so proud of my kid, and I really appreciate you interviewing him, Andrew, and I appreciate you guys tuning in for it. Like, I don't want to talk about polls. It makes me vomit, and that's, that's not a joke. And also, I don't really want to interview my own child, but he really does know his stuff, and I'm so appreciative that you would talk to him about it. Yeah. And- I would do this. In fact, I would do it more so if he were named Joe Smith <laughs> instead of Joe Dial. He knows his stuff. He's He's got the credential. But look, before we get back to the, the rest of the question, which is excellent, I want to talk about the first segment that Joe and I did, and that is polling aggregation. You talked about the Republican feelings industrial complex, and uh, this interplays with that, right? That Because those garbage polls that are flooding the zone from Republican pollsters or polls paid for by Republican organizations are now taking their place in the aggregator. So, for example, if you've checked 538 in the past couple of days, it shows Kamala Harris ahead, but only ahead by about 2% nationally, right? But there's this note. Over the past two weeks, 23 of the 121 polls released in the seven main swing states were from a Republican pollster or, or sponsor. Only four were from Democratic organizations, and the remaining 93 were nonpartisan. And, and then what it shows is, if you take those Republican-sponsored polls out of the average, you see Harris's margin go from 2 to 2.5%. Two and, and it makes a big difference in Pennsylvania, where it goes from essentially being a toss-up to her being a 1% favorite. Now, look— that's all still about 40 points too high for Donald Trump, in my view, right? I mean, look, we don't have to tell you show listeners that Donald Trump spent the last week on the campaign trail dancing to the YMCA and, you know, cracking jokes about Arnold Palmer's genitalia. And what, what even are we doing here? Yeah. Uh, OK. But. Counterpoint, Arab voters are very upset that comrade Kamala Harris, the worst vice president in the history of the United States and a low IQ individual, is campaigning with dumb as a rock war hawk Liz Cheney, who, like her father, the man that pushed Bush to ridiculously go to war in the Middle East, also wants to go to war with every Muslim country known to mankind. <laughs> Full sense. Uh, no, I'm taking a breath. Remember, Liz Cheney lost her congressional seat by the largest margin, 40 percent in history for a sitting congressperson. If Kamala gets four more years, the Middle East will spend the next four decades going up in flames and your kids will be going off to war, maybe even a third world war, something that will never happen with President Donald J. Trump in charge for our country's sake and for your kids. Vote Trump for peace. That noted. <laughs> peace. Because when I think peace with Muslims, I think Donald J. Trump. I'm sorry. I... I, I don't even understand. I, I don't even understand this pitch to Arab voters from Donald Trump, the guy who the second he got into office enacted the Muslim. But like, I can understand being angry about the Israel-Palestine conflict. I can understand being pissed at Biden and also Harris. I cannot understand taking those positions and thinking, oh, you know what will be better? Donald Trump in the White House. But yeah. OK, we've digressed a lot. Let's go back to our questions. Question number two, do the six buckets discussed vary in importance? If so, which are more and which are less important? Or is it not possible to know until the votes start being tallied? 
Yeah, and this is referring to really the six hypotheses that can be tested that we can look at the data as it comes in from Kentucky and Indiana at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on Election Day. So Joe says, yeah, all the buckets are important. Not surprised to hear him say that. But he says the exurbs data is probably the most important. And that's because volume wise, it's where Trump is going to net the most actual number of votes in the Rust Belt swing states. Right. People live there. Yeah. OK. Question number three. There was no discussion at all in this episode about red shifts, blue mirages, et cetera. Will those not be a factor in Indiana and Kentucky? And let me give you a little context there. In states where absentee and early ballots are counted before Election Day, there will be a red shift because the first results that come in will be slightly more Democratic. But then the tally will become more Republican as the in-person vote comes in. In states like Pennsylvania, where there's a stupid law that prevents anyone from counting any vote by mail ballots until after the poll closes, it will be the exact opposite. So there, the initial count will favor Republicans who are more likely to vote in person. And then when they start processing mail-in ballots, you'll have a blue shift. So Kentucky and Indiana are red shift states. And, you know, you and Joe, talked about this a little bit in terms of being careful to make sure that what you're looking at is the county and precinct level data, not the total vote. Yeah. And so to answer the question, the the bottom line is that that huge disparity in 2020 in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, that, that was a blue shift. Like, I think, Liz, you've pointed this out pretty explicitly. It's less likely to be replicated anywhere in 2024, right? Because, you know, we we don't have a pandemic. Democrats are not thinking that it is their social responsibility not to go to the polls on Election Day, right? Like, I, I, I want to go to the poll on Election Day. Right? I'm kind of a sentimentalist that way. Yeah, me too. But, you know, you and I are <clears throat> old. But, but, <laughs> Fair. But, but to be clear, right, it was, it was a really exaggerated difference in 2020 because, A, there was a pandemic, and B, Republicans made that one of their culture war issues. So mm-hmm. it was like, if you wanted to show that you were a real you know, MAGA Republican, you would get in line and sneeze on your neighbors in the polls. And Democrats were not doing that. And so it was like an eight to one disparity, right, that the mail-in ballots were basically like eight to one Democratic. And the same day voting was going to be much, much more skewed toward Republicans. And I don't I think it might be slightly skewed in in both directions, but I don't it's not going to be like eight to one anymore. So you're not going to have the same shifts, the red mirage, blue wave, whatever. Yeah, you'll still see an adjustment of the kind that you described, but that is particularly true in Indiana and Kentucky because there was just even in 2020, there's just less mail in voting and more in person voting by Democrats in those states. So there will be a little bit of a blue mirage effect. It it won't be pronounced. It's not going to affect processing the data, watching along at 6 p.m. And here in, in answering this question, Joe referenced to me the 2023 Kentucky governor's race in which incumbent Democrat Andy Bashir, who won by less than 1% in 2019, won re-election by five points in 2023. The election was called early on election night, right? And it never really displayed any of that, uh, you know, red mirage, blue wave. Thank God for Matt Bevins. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was who lost Andy Bashir. Next up, for people following on election night, Should we be thinking qualitatively or quantitatively about the six buckets? In other words, is directionally favoring one candidate or the other what we should be looking for, or are the actual magnitudes of difference what we should be looking at? Yeah, great question. Straightforward answer. It's the actual magnitudes, right? And we give those target numbers in the episode. And that's because it's not apples to apples, right? There are lots of moving pieces that make a 2024 county different than a 2020 county. So you want to look absolute numbers, do they meet those targets that we talk about in the episode? Yeah. And I want to paraphrase that last part, because essentially the question is, you guys compared Indiana and Kentucky to the Rust Belt states, but how does that play into Harris's alternate path in the Sun Belt states? Yeah. uh, Also, great question. Liz, I think you and I agree on this. I mean, the data shows that the, the Sun Belt path remains viable. But There's a good reason why Kentucky and Indiana data will not test those same hypotheses in the Sunbelt states. And the Sunbelt states, by the way, are Arizona and Nevada in the West and North Carolina and Georgia in the East. So southern latitude states. Right. And the reason that it's just not comparable is that 
Kentucky and Indiana are much, much whiter than those southern states, right? So demographically, the exurbs in Charlotte and Phoenix look very different than the Louisville and Cincinnati exurbs, whereas the, the Philly exurbs, the Milwaukee exurbs, that they look demographically much more similar to those exurbs. So comparable to Rust Belt, you cannot read anything about the Sun Belt states out of the results that come in from Kentucky and India. Yeah, although I suppose that maybe if Joe were here, he would say one of the things that he was looking at was black turnout in Indianapolis and Lexington. If black turnout is up or down in those places, perhaps you can make some kind of extrapolation. I, I wouldn't. I would I would wait, but maybe that's the answer to the question. Yep. All right. I so appreciate those questions. I so appreciate you guys giving my kid uh, such a warm reception. And we will be back on Thursday with written content and Friday with our regular show, probably <laughs> devoted to the election. Fingers crossed. All right. See you guys. Law and Chaos Podcast is a production of Ray Zipson Media LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blankenagle. Law and Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Ray Zipson Media LLC, all rights reserved.